It's great to see you again. We're back here in our next session at DXI, this time with none other than Alex Hackel. And uh, I'm gonna do a quick introduction here uh, of Alex. Some of you know him, some of you meeting him for the first time. Uh, he's chiming in from, where are you at in Sweden? Stockholm. You're in Stockholm. So uh, what time is it there in Stockholm, Alex? It's um, six o'clock at night. Six o'clock, okay. So it's uh, time, after this you can go have dinner. That's exactly. awesome, that's awesome. Uh, well, uh, while Alex gets, uh, gets set up here, uh, we'll be with him for about 55 minutes. He's got an amazing slideshow to, to walk you through and tell you some stories. Uh, and then I'll come back in and we'll have some Q&A at the end. But uh, Alex uh, uh, is a, was a former member of the US, uh, US uh, ski team uh, for four years. He uh, uh, competed in, uh, it was a slope style uh, competition and uh, amazing, uh, amazing uh, uh, time with the, the US team. Um, he's defined as being, I would, I guess you're, uh, you'll tell us about it, being an urban, urban skier or a, a street skier. And so mm -hmm. that's, uh, he's going to tell you all about that. Um, many of you know the amazing brand. Uh, he's a former pro rider for the amazing brand out of Portland, ON uh, 3P. He was a pro rider for them for four years and a pro model. So you, you might actually be on an Alex Heckle ski. Uh, that would be awesome. He's been featured in uh, the Ski Journal, uh, Free Skier. In 2020, in 2020, he received a bronze in the Real Ski X Games and was fan favorite. Yes, fan favorite. And in 2021, received a silver uh, in the X Games Real Ski. His new movies, which I hope he's going to tell us about, two of my favorites are um, uh, Is There Time for Matching Socks? which over the last nine months has had over 83,000 views on YouTube. Yes, thank you, Alex, that's awesome. And my favorite, I was plugging this last night, which is uh, Love You Too, which in one month, less than one month, has 24,000 views. I think a thousand of them are my views. So uh, uh, I'm gonna just quote uh, 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 Free Skier Magazine, and then we're gonna kick it off here. Free Skier uh, says this about Alex, hailing from the quaint, mountainous ski town that is Boston, Massachusetts. Alex Hackle is a beastly street skier who embodies what's pers with what personal style can mean in skiing. So thank you. Let's have a big DXI welcome for Alex. And uh, if you're in the Q&A, uh, it would be great to post maybe what country, uh, where you're chiming in from so that we know that we're live and we have no technical issues. So I'm just going to where are you? And um, we'll see who responds. Sounds good. Should I wait for the response before I? Continue? Well, we'll just we'll just type that in. We'll see if we we'll see if we get any uh, responses. And uh, there's a modest delay, but go ahead and 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 start the start your talk. And once the talk gets going and make sure it's working, I'll drop out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the introduction and uh, I'll hop right into it. So uh, there is a smart class, there's a normal class and there's a stupid class. And if you get put in the smart class, you're going to get a great education and you're going to be able to be set up for success and be able to go to college. If you're in the normal class, you're going to get an okay education and it's, you know, you might go to college, you might not. And if you get put in the stupid class, uh, you're not going to get a great education. Your peers are going to have a better education and you're not going to be able to be set up for success. And this is how the education system worked in rural Vermont when my dad grew up. And they put you in these classes based on standardized testing. And my dad was dyslexic before there was such a thing as dyslexia. It was just you're stupid. And when he did his testing, he tested into the dumb class. And this woman right here, my grandmother, uh, came to the school when she found out, dragged my father Evan to the principal's office and said, Mr. Principal, my son is not stupid. He is smart. And if you put him in the smart class, I guarantee that he will succeed. And she kicked and she screamed and she took a stand for my father's education. 
and my father got put in that smart class. And to his credit, it must have been super hard with no help, no special ed. And he just scratched and clawed his way and he succeeded in the smart class and he ended up getting a master's degree in business. And this stand that my grandmother took for my father's education had irreversible positive effects on his life and irreversible positive effects on my life. And it's really this stand that people have been taking for dyslexic people. And why I love this dyslexia symposium is that we get to talk about this stigma so that we don't have to have our kids and that we don't have to take that stand for them and that we can we can talk about it and we can empower dyslexic people. And I'm so thankful for my grandmother and my father and my family who have took a stand for my education and have not allowed me to feel that my dyslexia is, is me being stupid or that my dyslexia is anything other than a superpower. That's so awesome, now, Alex. I'm going to drop out and the show is yours. Thank you. All so right. now let me tell you, uh, that was my father's experience in school. So let me tell you about my experience. So I'm nine years old and I'm in third grade and I have this nightmare, but this nightmare, it's, has nothing to do with monsters. I don't die in this nightmare. I've had those nightmares and this nightmare is scarier than that. And this nightmare is that I'm in my seat at school. It's Miss Stevens class and I'm getting yelled at again. And I'm trying so hard to learn. I want to learn with every molecule in my body. I want to fit in and I just really want to take in this information. And, you know, I would just get yelled at by Miss Stevens because I wasn't understanding the concepts quick enough. And I woke up from the stream and it was 6.30 in the morning and I had to go to school. And I guess I just realized that, wow, like this system really isn't made for me. And when you're dyslexic, you realize that the teaching style that the teachers have and this curriculum, it really isn't set up and isn't orientated toward your learning style. And it's almost like the book doesn't apply to you. You're reading it, but if you actually want to learn it, you have to fend for yourself. and you have to make sure that you're able to find these techniques so that you can succeed. And to be honest, there's a huge lack of understanding. And I think what Miss Stevens saw in me is she just saw somebody who was having a hard time learning and thought that if I was having a hard time learning, then I must be intentionally derailing the classes with my questions or that I'm just not trying. And so I would get yelled at, I would get condescending answers, like, are you not paying attention, this, this, or that. And it made learning for me in school humiliating and degrading because the, here's this teacher and here's this authority figure who should be helping me learning. But instead, there is no understanding for this, for this, for this dyslexia I have and this learning disability. Instead, it's just being classified as not trying or derailing the class. And, you know, that left me feeling like a freak. I mean, to be honest, freak meter 100%. Uh, I was lucky and I was, you know, getting taken out of class uh, occasionally to do special ed classes and to really get taught one-on-one uh, -on -one in a smaller environment. And, and that was awesome. I'm thankful for that. But that also really put a target on my back. I mean, school, it's not just learning, but it's a social environment as well. And it's a very critical social environment. And when you're getting taken out of class, people are noticing, not just yourself, but everybody. And, you know, you're, you're getting labeled a freak. And if you don't brand your dyslexia correctly, I, it's pretty easy for people to mistake you as being stupid or, you know, it, it's really easy to be made fun of and teased for it because they're not getting pulled out of class. And I guess the biggest thing is lack of self-understanding. I mean, it wasn't just my teacher. It wasn't just Miss Stevens who didn't understand what was going on. I mean, I'm nine. I, I, I know I have dyslexia, but what is dyslexia? And like, why am I trying so hard? Why am I putting in all this effort, but feeling like I'm coming up way shorter than the, these other kids? Like, why are they getting it and I'm not getting it? And what are these special classes? Like, I don't, I don't know what these special classes are and why am I being put in these special classes? There was not just a lack of understanding from my teachers, but there was a lack of understanding for myself of, of what this dyslexia was and what its extent was. And, you know, I felt a lot of judgment from my teachers and peers. I felt like I was being marked as special. I got bullied for being dyslexic and I got bullied for performing poorly in school. And this led to a depression at a, a really young age. And 
I, I really don't think that many people have a depression at that young of an age. And I think that dyslexia kind of accelerated that. But I, I saw something a little later, you know, like in elementary school, you know, it was it was hell. And I saw dyslexia as, as being this villain in my life and something that I couldn't understand and, and, and curse. But when I got a little bit older, I, I started to see something and, and it was the tides were turning and these experiences that I was getting because I was dyslexic were actually shaping me in a way that was giving me character traits that were actually going to be setting me up for success. And, you know, being dyslexic is being different and you're getting a different education and you're learning not just the curriculum, but you're learning all this other stuff at the same time. And, you know, basically just how to how to survive and how to learn in, in a way that's not taught in the curriculum. And that gives you the skill sets. And, you know, eventually it just came a time where I said, you know what, like, I, I actually think this dyslexia is, you know, it's working for me. And, uh, you know, a lot of that had to do with my journey in free skiing. This is my mother uh, taking me skiing. I think I was about five years old in this picture and uh, up in Sunday River, Maine, where I learned to ski. And I guess back to these superpowers of dyslexia, I, I realized that dyslexia gave me this relationship with failure. I think that a lot of my peers were used to getting things like really quickly, like picking up on things. And, and when the going went tough, they got frustrated and, and they stopped. And as a dyslexic kid trying to learn, you know, you have to try everything to figure out your learning style. And so I just realized that I was able to handle failure in, in a completely different way than my peers. And that if I was going to be a professional free skier or professional at anything, that there was going to be a lot of failure involved in that. I had a pretty good, you know, I had a pretty good pedigree to deal with it. So this is a video I'm going to show you uh, to highlight this relationship I have with failure. And uh, it was Memorial Day weekend. All the mountains were closed in the East Coast of America, but they saved the snow. And uh, for Memorial Day weekend only, they take the tarps off the snow and they put some rails so people can have fun on the holidays. And I begged my mom to take me up uh, to Stovermont, which is three hours each way to um, to let me to let me do this. And, and she complied. And this is me skiing. And I, I dug this up when I was uh, finding content for the speech. And I mean, if you look at this, I can't even believe to today that I keep going and I'm just falling and falling. And these aren't even all my tries. Like there's so many more tries than you saw than this. And, and it, it's, you know, I was even impressed. Like, wow, I mean, th this is crazy. Like, how could I keep going? And to be honest, I, I didn't get the trick that day. And what I thought was crazy was that my memory of this day was so positive. I loved this day. This day was like the best day of my life. I got to go skiing after the mountains were closed and I didn't see this as failure. I saw this as I was so close, so, so close to landing this back 360 swap. And if I could land this back 360 swap, my idols on skis could do it. And if they could do it and I'm almost there, then maybe I have a chance. And, uh, you know, that just highlights that relationship that I have with failure. I wasn't afraid of it. I was used to it. I experienced it in school all the time being dyslexic. And when it came to skiing, I, I realized that I was able to take failure and see the positive in it. And then another thing that dyslexia really set me up for in my skiing career was being doubted and not listening. You know, I, I really wasn't that talented of a skier when I was young. And I know that like a lot of people say that, but uh, to, to give you like an example, uh, I was 12 years old and I was doing this weekend program of the Sunday River, Maine. It was called GSR. Uh, and I think it was like Gould Academy Sunday River weekend program. And uh, when you're 12, it's the first season that you're finally able to ride with the older kids. Before that, you have to ride with the younger kids and, you know, like elementary school kids. And then when you're 12, you get to ride with the big kids and you get to ride park. The younger kids, they have to work on their technique, routing moguls. And so I show up that year uh, with piss and vinegar in my blood, just so excited. And all the kids that I've been going to this program with who are my age, um, they get out and there's a, they get outside of the, you know, the lodge and there's a circle to the right. And that's with the big kids, 12 and older. And then the circle to the left is the small kids who are going to ski moguls, 11 and older. And all the peers of mine, they get chosen and they go on the right. 
And then I hear my name and I get called to the left. And I'm going to go ski moguls with the young kids. And this was humiliating. This was totally humiliating. I mean, it, it's really hard to convey how humiliating that actually was to me. And I remember at this weekend program, they had sort of like parent teacher meetings and my uh, coach at the time during the parent teacher meeting with my father, he said, you know what, Alex, he, he's not that good. And to be honest, he's too small and he's not going to be a professional skier. He's, he's too small to be a professional skier and he has no future in this. If you like skiing, great. Like it's good. He likes skiing, but don't ever think that your son's going to be a professional free skier. And just think about that. And then think about that conversation that my grandmother had with the principal when they're trying to tell my father that, that he should be in the stupid class. And basically that I was used to people judging me on the surface. I was used to people seeing my test scores and writing me off. And, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid to know that I had something deeper in myself to give and that I had these talents and that an authority figure telling me and doubting me and telling me I couldn't be a professional three skier. Well, that wasn't going to stand in my way. I was just going to find a community that was going to embrace me and let my passion and hard work and work ethic, you know, really take me. So, you know, through all those experiences of being dyslexic, you know, I learned quick that uh, if somebody doubts you, you don't have to listen to them. Like, you know what you're made of, you know, your metal. And then also dyslexia, you know, it taught me critical thinking and going back to this whole, the curriculum is not for you. I, I saw with my skiing that, you know, I could just think about things just slightly different. And I was used to that failure. And I was also used to like, okay, well that didn't work. Like, how can I look at this a little bit differently or how can I adapt? And, you know, I think I was a lot more gritty in, I had a lot more grit in that way than my peers. And I really think that dyslexia has really taught me this sort of like on the fly critical thinking of, okay, I don't understand it like this. How do I think about it so I can understand it? And it's a wonderful gift of dyslexia. And then I, I found my stride and, uh, I begged and I begged and I begged. And I, in the 10th grade, got to go to Wendell's Academy, which is now called Y East Mountain Academy. And I just got to take all this stuff, you know, all those dyslexic advantages and all the knowledge I was building at my home mountain. And then I got to put into this positive structure of Wendell's, which is you get to go skiing every day, you get coaches, you have these amazing training facilities, trampolines, airbags. I mean, it was heaven. And I got to meet Mike Hanley, as you see picture on the left, and, and he was my coach. And, and this guy, he really believed in me. And when I met him and I, you know, took all those things that I had inside me and I got to this place and I finally had the place and the mountains that could, you know, really lend to me being a professional skier and, and this coach who believed in me, I, I really hit my stride. And, you know, I guess one of the biggest things for me at the beginning was that I didn't know how to be coached. Uh, if you have been listening, you realize that my first coach was not a very good coach and was not particularly uh, nice to me or didn't believe me at all. And then my experiences with most of my teachers growing up was, uh, you know, very short tempered and really not supporting me and, and, and not really trying to, to see me succeed. So I, I built up this resentment for these teacher figures in my life. And when I met Mike, who, was able to look past the surface. And he saw this kid with so much passion for free skiing. He saw this kid who was basically willing to do whatever and was incredibly positive, anything that would get him a step forward to being a professional free skier. And, and he believed in me and he believed in me at really early, but I didn't know how to take his support because being dyslexic, I wasn't used to getting support in this way. So it, it, it took me a second to learn how to accept support. But then, uh, I finally accepted support and I finally uh, learned to trust and then our relationship exploded. And I remember the day, actually, um, there was uh, somebody who graduated from Dells. They came back and they had dinner with us. And after dinner, she said, OK, like, I want to have a private conversation with you three. And it was me and two other kids. She said, look at Mike's a genius. He'll teach you any trick you want to know. And I know he's a little difficult at times, but if you listen to him, he, he can teach you anything. And then the next day I, I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, Hey, why am I here? I want to be a professional free skier. 
okay, if Mike can get me to that point, then I'll do anything. I'll, I'll listen to him. He might be crazy, but I'll listen to him. And then like that day I learned three tricks. Then we went skiing again, two days later, I learned five tricks. And then I realized like, wow, like he's amazing and I can really do this. And if he's on my side, we got this. And this is uh, where I learned like several lessons. And one of those lessons was like, no excuses. Um, one of the great things about sports is, is it's for the most part a level playing field and you know, being dyslexic doesn't matter. And basically, if you work hard, that will be your results. And if you don't work hard, that will be your results. And there's no excuses for not working hard and not giving your maximum effort. And then also like always be prepared. Like one of the things that he taught me was like competition day can be any day. Competition day doesn't only happen on these sunny days. Uh, it happens on days where it's snowing sideways, where it's icy, where it's windy. And so when I would go out with Mike, even on non-competition days, I would do my full competition run, uh, third run of the day, no matter what. Uh, as long as I can make speed for the jumps, I was doing it. And there would be days where the other national teams and the other competitors wouldn't even be skiing because there was such bad conditions. And I would be out there with Mike and he'd be making me do my full run, third run of the day, like always. And that was unbelievable to my success later on. And I'll, and I'll follow up with that later on. But also, um, Mike really taught me about self-belief. Like what I do is really dangerous and it requires a large amount of self-belief. And it also like requires you understanding that it is fight or flight when you're out there. And that basically you, have, you, you choose to land and you choose the positive thought process and, and you choose to believe in yourself more than you choose that you're going to fail. And, and those things really just stuck with me. And then, uh, you know, we worked together for a while and coming into my senior year of high school, I just, that summer, everything clicked and I really took in what Mike was telling me and I took all this passion that I had and I just started perfecting the craft and I came 20th in the world on the slope south circuit. And I mean, I was outperforming these kids that were so much more talented than me. And I was doing it because I was so prepared. I mean, basically competition day would come and it would be bad weather and I would land. I would land no matter what. And then the kids that only practice in the sun, they would fall. And, you know, basically like I was actually doing it right now. Like I was perfecting the craft of being a free skier and I was transforming from this scrawny kid from the East Coast uh, to being a formidable force in, in free skiing and being 20th in the world and, and really, you know, really doing it. And I'm going to show you a video now from West Coast Sessions. And this is in May. And uh, this is May when I was 17. And this is like you can see, it's a huge jump. It's an epic sunset shoot. And and it's uh, it's where I did my first triple cork 10. And when I did a triple cork 10 is coming up soon. It was the second person in the world to do it. And it was completely groundbreaking. And it, it just was such a big day because it, it made a statement that not only was I a good skier, but I was capable of contributing and, and pioneering. And so the double cork 10 is coming up right now. So uh, a double cork 10, for those that don't know, that is when you go upside down three times and then you spin around three times. And uh, at that time, it, it was really groundbreaking. And, you know, working with Mike, uh, it just it just showed me what a difference a teacher can make, and uh, a great story about Mike's like vision that and how much he saw in me was before I did this triple cork ten about three months before, and he had a conversation with my dad, and, and he said Alex is doing great, uh, he's going to learn a triple soon, and, and that's just going to really take his skiing to the next level. And if I had been there when he told my dad that three months earlier. I would have been so mad. I would have been, how could you tell my dad that? That's crazy. Like triples, they're so scary. They're like, no way. Like stop telling my dad that. Stop getting his hopes up. And uh, then, I mean, I didn't know this until after. Uh, so I, I wasn't there. And I did the, I did the triple three months later. And, and I, he didn't even tell me to do the triple. I, I honestly looked at him and I said, do you think I can do it? And he said, yes. And then I did the triple. We didn't even talk about doing the triple. We were just on that wavelength. And what that showed me is that like when you're a teacher and I know there's a lot of teachers in this audience and this applies a lot to dyslexic kids. It's like, are you 
which teacher are you choosing to be? Are you choosing to be Miss Stevens or Mike Hanley? Are you choosing to see something in the people that you're teaching it and to see things past the surface, past the test results, and really sort of believe in them and coach them into that vision? Or are you just looking at the things that are easy to see and writing them off and taking the easy way out? And, you know, I choose this I because it really is a, a great coach and great teacher has the ability to see something in you that you couldn't see. Like I couldn't see that I could do the triple. Mike saw it in me five months beforehand. And then he coached me up to that point. And, and basically it's not just the teachers too. It's just, who are we as people? Are we, are we seeing things in people and, and coaching up to their greatness? Or are we just taking the easy ride out and, and being the Miss Stevens? Uh, so after that jump shoot and everything, and after coming 20th in the slope style circuit, I got named to the US ski team. And it was a huge honor. It opened so much doors. I got to work with these physical therapists and I got a scholarship to Westminster in Utah. And, you know, it really was just such an honor. And, you know, as a kid growing up dyslexic and super tiny for my age, to think that I would make it to the highest level of a sport was nuts. And to think that I would make it at 17 and being named to the US ski team at 17 years old was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. But things came grinding to a halt. I tore my ACL and there was a reemergence of, of a lot of speed bumps. And it was something that I realized uh, was that basically uh, growing up with dyslexia and having a hard time in school and being ostracized, like those have effects later on in my life. Like th that wasn't just when I was younger, those feelings and those emotions, they last. And that basically it's, it's not crazy that being called stupid when you're a kid and being, you know, feeling special and, you know, being yelled at by teachers and, and, and really trying and still getting yelled at, like that has long lasting effects in your adult life. And so basically I felt like an imposter. I, I couldn't understand for the life of me how I was actually succeeding because I was so used to failing and, and seeing my peers succeed. And I had bad self-esteem and I had emotional baggage from those years. And then I, I went back to depression. Uh, when I tore my ACL, I couldn't ski and skiing was how I was covering that depression that I had as a kid who was confused and, and basically was struggling in school. And all that depression that I had when I was a kid and telling you that I was a depressed kid, it was still there. I was just finding something to cover it and to hide behind. And, and when I tore my ACL, I, I realized I couldn't ski and I couldn't hide behind that anymore. And that, that made me take responsibility for it. Uh, I, I understood that I had to properly water my own tree because if I didn't do it, it was going to become toxic and it was going to get in my way. And that basically that mental health is not a negative thing, but something that we have to take responsibility for so that it doesn't allow us to stop our growth. And I think I just want to take the time. Like if you're anybody in here dealing with depression or mental health, uh, you know, it, you're not alone. And then also if you're a dyslexic kid and, and you're feeling yourself in the story that I'm telling, you know, it's okay to have mental health issues and it's okay that your upbringing and difficulty in school could, could be leading to some of those. And that basically uh, it's okay. And the best thing that I can say is just that we take responsibility for it because we don't let this stand in our way. We, we get to see these effects of dyslexia that even when we're out of school uh, still hang with us and, and we get to take responsibility for them. And so after this sort of these speed bumps, uh, so I tore my ACL and then I had all these injuries after it. So I didn't get back on skis really for a year and a half because I just had this bad string of injuries and, uh, you know, th these bouts with depression. And it, and it really made me like sort out like what are my priorities? And, and I realized that competing in slope style was not my priority. Um, competing in slope style was something that I was doing because I was good at it and because I enjoyed getting a number next to my name that told me that this is how good I was and I could show my dad that and I could get gratification. But that my real calling for, for skiing was making ski films. And I felt like that making ski films was fitting in with my skill sets and that if I made ski films, I could have an impact in the ski world far greater than if I competed. So let's talk a bit about what are those, what, what is filming skiing what characteristics make a good film skier? So in a competition, uh, the, the course is chosen, 
and then you get one to two runs to complete. So you have to complete your run in one, two runs or else uh, you don't get three runs. And so basically there's so much pressure on performing at the day and then your vision is limited to the course. Whereas in film skiing, you can film anywhere and the vision is endless. So basically to film, you have to have a strong vision and you get to create that vision. And then you get to be really persistent because you don't have that one or two runs. You have all day. I mean, I've filmed things for four days. I've, I've legitimately tried things 300 plus times. And when you're in this environment where all the other people who are really good are also really persistent, <laughs> you don't just have to have vision and persistency. You have to always go the extra mile because if you're going to stick out in film skiing, uh, you have to be willing to put in those four days to get that one amazing shot because your peers will do it. And then finally, responsibility. Uh, when you're competing, um, they tell you when to show up, they tell you when to go home, it's practice hours, this or that. And when you're filming, uh, you could film for two hours, you could film for 10 hours, you could, you could not go filming that day. The responsibility to get it done and the responsibility to do it at a very high level without any coaches and without any set times really makes it so that you have to put on the responsibility to, to create these amazing things. So I made the decision and then I found this group called The Bunch. And uh, together with The Bunch, we've made a whole bunch of movies. And The Bunch is a Swedish film crew and they're my best friends as well. And meeting who you see in this picture, Paul, uh, who's also a great skier and filmer and Magnus, uh, these two individuals were just as driven as me to create these amazing ski films that could potentially have done correctly, could change the change the the scene of ski films and, and push the ski film culture forward. And and with these two, I basically I think we've produced now five films. We've won best cinematography, we've won best street film. Uh and, and basically I just started, quite frankly, like making the things in skiing that I dreamed of making as a kid and and feeling like the impact that I always wanted to make on skiing and that when I was that kid in Stowe, Vermont, like failing and falling every time, that basically that I finally arrived and was starting to be able to create things that I was proud of. So after filming about four of my own uh, ski films, I got invited to X Games Real Ski. And X Games Real Ski is the only film competition in X Games. And what they do is they invite six skiers, they give them three months, they allow them to ski anywhere, and you have to make a 90 second video. And then they judge these videos and then you get X Games medals if you reach the podium. And it was crazy because when I gave up competing, I gave up this idea that I was ever going to be an X Games medalist, or I gave up this idea of being able to realize those goals. And then through finding my passion and going for my passion of filmmaking, I somehow took this back road to getting into X Games. And uh, I got invited, and this is my year one video uh, that I did in 2020, and I'm going to play it. And I know it might lag here or there, but you'll get, you know, some good screenshots and idea and it's only 90 seconds. So hopefully you'll be able to see it. Oh, my God. 
So that was my first year video and I, I got bronze and I won the fan favorite award. So basically they have online voting and people voted that they liked my video the best. And for me, this was an amazing moment. Uh, the person pictured on my left is Paul, uh, the, the person in the bunch and, and he filmed it. And, uh, it meant so much to me that to go through the journey with him, but also just, uh, when you win an X Games medal, it, it's, it's validation for everything. It's validation that you have one and the, the people that you're in when you have one, it's a, it's a unique, special group and that nobody can, can take that experience away from you. And that video that I did for me up until that point, it was not just the best video I'd done, but it was by far and wide the best video I'd done in, in many ways was that film segment that I was chasing for so long. And then basically after, after I did that one, uh, you know, it was like, now what? And basically it's like, we just did that. It was a huge success. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just like life, you know, it's, it's an ever moving goalpost, you know, you're, you're getting there and you think the goalpost is there and then and it's further, you know, and because I won the fan favorite, I got invited back for the, for the year after. So we knew like we, we had to do something and, you know, we didn't get the gold. So we, we wanted to keep going, but there was new challenges this second year. And, the, one of the biggest challenges was the pandemic happened. And I remember I, I filmed that video and I was at the apex of my, my skiing and my powers of, in skiing at that time. And uh, I mean, the world shut down and I moved back in with my parents. And when time, the time when I usually be skiing and preparing for my next video, I, I was in quarantine. And then this year it's uh, higher expectations. Uh, the year before, I was an underdog. Nobody expected anything of me. This year, I won the fan favorite award. I took home the bronze, and and people would have high expectations for this video. And not only that, but I had high expectations. I, I it was no longer enough to to come on the podium. We we needed to do better. And then, if basically not skiing between getting winning my bronze and then starting to ski for my silver, and those high expectations wasn't enough with all these travel restrictions and then the changes that happened in both me and my filmer's life, instead of having three months that we got, we were only able to film for three weeks of the three months that we were allotted. So we actually had one third of the time to make this new video happen. And basically this was a situation uh, that was difficult. Uh, all of a sudden we're at a disadvantage. People have more time than us. And we now have this other video that we're getting judged against that we, we created. But for me as a dyslexic person, uh, I, I felt at home almost. I mean, you know, the curriculum isn't built for you. You got to find your own way. So basically me and Paul started brainstorming and we came up with a new vision. Uh, this time we were going to do something completely different. We weren't going to, you know, have it be as trick intensive. We were going to focus on the filmmaking of the video because it is a film competition. And so we were going to choose to ski in areas that were very conducive for ski or for filming and these film concepts and that we were going to slow it down. We weren't, we didn't have the time. So we couldn't go after the 15, 16 clips that we were going after last year. We were now going after 10, but 10 that had a, a huge huge quality of them and, and fit with the other nine so good. And, and we were going to make this video slow, like real skis because of the time constraint, the, the videos are fast. And basically we decided that we were going to slow it down. And quite frankly, we were going to make a video that, that only would be judged against our own video and not from our video last year, but this video, because we were going to make something completely unique. And so this, this was like a, this was really big. This was betting on ourselves and, and really choosing to make a video uh, completely different. And I, I look back making this uh, and look back also to growing up with dyslexia and think like, wow, like it's, it makes sense that I, I had the courage to do it now because I've been doing things a little differently since a young age and that this wasn't much different. So I'm going to play my second real ski video and you'll be able to see basically the differences between the two and see how this one's a little more artistic and, and, and cinematic. Yes, Grunden and Sinn. 
So that was my video the second time around. And as you can see, it was totally different than, than my first real ski video. And, and it took a completely different side of me uh, to make. Uh, the first year we had the luxury of time. The second year we didn't. We had three weeks and our first week filming went terribly. So I had 13 days uh, to do eight tricks and not just eight tricks that uh, were okay, but eight tricks that were some of the hardest tricks I've done up to my life. And I would have to do one trick, like at the beginning of it, I, I like mapped out the time and I basically had to land a trick like almost every single day. So it would be legitimately like waking up and doing the hardest trick of my life to then go out and finding the next place where I could do the hardest trick of my life and doing the hardest trick of my life. And it went like that for 13 days. And uh, the deadline day, uh, we were in Europe so we actually got more time because the, the event is in Denver time. So we we got the full deadline day. And uh, I was out there and uh, I was out there on deadline day, got the last trick at 6 p.m., went home, got the trick and got the video into the computer and then Par edited it all the way up until uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning and, and sent it in. So basically we used every single second we had and we were filming the absolute deadline. And, and I mean, I had mental breakdowns filming for it. I remember crying in, in a pile of snow, thinking like, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to make it. All this pressure is riding on me. I have to deliver and I'm not going to make it. And then I remember screaming a victory when I landed these tricks and finding these new boundaries I had in myself. Like I didn't even know that I could ski this good, this consistently under this much stress. And here I am, I'm finding out these new things about myself under the crunch time of the filming. And we ended up getting silver. And it felt like uh, my PhD uh, in resilience paid off. Like it, it felt like this was a culmination, not just of my skiing. Like the first year was a culmination of my skiing, but this year was a culmination of all the things that I'm telling you about in this presentation. Uh, growing up with dyslexia, finding the way to succeed there, then you know finding my way onto the world tour and having the guidance of Mike Hanley and, and all these life lessons and, and going through that depression of, and then tearing my ACL and basically like to me like getting the silver in the, in the time and the constraints that we had was really like just this amazing culmination not just of my skiing but but of so much more and basically that's the story of, of my skiing up until now and I want to talk about some key themes and uh, the themes of changing the lens, support, adaptation, and trust. And basically changing the lens is, is coming from victim to responsible. And when I was a kid, I lived as a victim of my dyslexia and I let my dyslexia decide a lot of things. And I chose to see it as a villain in my life. And as I got older, I chose to take responsibility for it and I chose to see it as a hero. I chose to see it as something that helped me for the better and that we all don't get to choose if we're dyslexic or not, but we get to choose the way and the lens in which we look at it. And then support. I mean, I've had tremendous support from the people around me and I had a family that would not allow dyslexia to define me. They wouldn't allow me to believe that I was stupid. They, they wouldn't allow teachers to, to treat me differently. They would, they would fight that I would get a good education. And then when it came to me not receiving support in my free skiing career, they didn't 
trust the coaches. I mean, it's crazy to think that, uh, you know, here is a professional coach telling my dad that I could never be a professional skier. And my dad didn't listen to him. He listened instead to this tiny, scrawny little 12 year old kid who had so much passion for skiing. And basically that support that I get, not just from my family around dyslexia, but then also the people that I make these ski films with is absolutely amazing. And is a huge part of my journey. And then relentless adaptation. I mean, throughout all of this and throughout, you know, my schooling as a kid to basically figuring out how, how to shape myself into being a world-class skier. Like I had to just, I was constantly dying and being rebirthed and adapting and succeeding and failing. And basically like there's so much adaptation and the quicker that we can open our arms and embrace the change, like the quicker that we can just be on, you know, weeding the charge and instead of on the back feet and that any journey, relentless adaptation will be necessary. And then ultimately like trust, like having trust that things will work out. And I guess I really want to take this time to talk to the dyslexic kids here who might still be living in the nightmare version, you know, like the, the version that I myself was living in for so long. And basically like uh, just have trust that the dyslexia that you have is building you for successes. It's teaching you different lessons than other kids and is setting you up for a path that's different but that will lead you to a place of success and that basically have trust that it's a, it's a super power and, and not a villain. And then, you know, the final thing is like dyslexia is always going to be a driving force in your journey. Like for me, like dyslexia, it's just like this basket of fruit. Like it's, it's a part of my like basket of success or my basket of tools. Like it, it's, it's always in there for me. And basically if, if you're a kid and you have dyslexia, like, know that it doesn't define you and that it's no excuse like that you're capable and that if, if nobody believes in you i believe in you and that basically if, if nobody is able to to support you that you are supported and that your dyslexia is that superpower and then if you're a teacher you know i, I really hope that you can just see that there's a lot more uh, under the surface for some of these dyslexic kids uh, and uh, you know my story with mental health and being ostracized and all that stuff. I, I really don't think that it's that uncommon. Uh, and I, I see that in my dad, I see that in other dyslexic people and, and basically having that empathy and, and choosing to see that greater, greater power for and greater good for these uh, dyslexic kids. And then just in general to everybody in this conference, like, you know, let's, let's just talk about this stigma and let's share success stories and let's embrace our journeys so that we can proverbially be bringing the dyslexic community to the world and saying, we're not stupid. We're, we're in the smart class and, and basically be taking the stand for not just ourselves, but for the fellow dyslexic kids and dyslexic community. And without further ado, thank you all so much for listening. Oh, round of applause. Thank you, Alex. That was as absolutely, my mind is blown. I mean, if you have a question, put it in the chat. I, I will hope to get to some of them, but I just, I, seriously, I want to get some T-shirts that have Alex Hackle sayings on them. I wrote one down, uh, waking up and doing the hardest trick in my life. That's the shirt I want. That's the shirt I want. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I just, we, we'll, we'll wait for a couple of questions. We've got about four or five minutes. Um, thank you. That was just a, a, exceptional. Uh, growing up on, on Warren Miller and TGR, I just want to say, you compress into 90 seconds what they try and communicate in 90 minutes. So I just, your, your films are exceptional. And um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the finding the amazing shot? Is that luck? Is it experience? Is it, what is it? Uh, it's, it's experience. So basically when you're new, it's hard to find that shot. But then when you're experienced and after years of doing it, you start to see like basically what are the small things that are going to make it amazing and uh you you just learn the, those hard lessons like I, I usually say it takes somebody like three years to become a really good street skier because the first two years you know they're they're learning the lessons and then the third year they're finally able to take all that knowledge and then find those amazing shots more consistently one of the things that dyslexics are oftentimes known for is that visualization the ability to see it in their own mind's eye can you Talk to us about, you know, maybe standing up there the first time when you're going to do the triple core 10. Did you picture it in your mind? 
how did you get to that moment where okay i'm gonna i'm going definitely like i i always felt like i was a very visual learner and i guess with that trick um i visualized it i thought about it uh there was one other person in the world who'd done it so i'd looked at him do it and you know as a kid learning tricks that'd be always how i would do it like i would i would just watch somebody i'd watch these videos over and over again i'd look at how their hips moved i'd look at how their shoulders would move and then I, i would dream about it well i'm just reading some of the comments and some of the comments are blown away wow bravo mind blowing so just this is this is awesome we probably got time i think we've got three more minutes i've probably got time for one or two more questions can you talk a little bit about the music cuz that really the music in your in your ski films really sets it apart who comes up with that and and um what who who picks it uh it's like a, a group effort of all of the people involved on the creative end of the making a ski film personally i i love the creative end so uh i'm often involved in those decisions and and for my own real skis uh the first year i was the one that found that that track and then i enrolled my filmer that this was the good track and basically we had some like other thoughts uh but this one ended up being the best and then the second year when we like really wanted to come with a completely new vibe and you know people had done the vibe of like i love how emotional the first song is and it's it's really kind of like feel good song like but it's an emotional song it takes you on a journey it's an emotional journey let's just say and then the second year it's a swedish folk song uh and it's a beautiful song uh the lyrics go who can sail without the wind who can row without a oar uh who can uh leave their friends without crying and the then he comes back in and says i can sail without the wind and i can row without a oar but to leave my friend without crying a tear i can't do that and basically it's just this very beautiful song and uh with real skis it's interesting cuz you either have to cut the song to make it shorter or you have to find short songs and that song was almost a minute 30 on the dot and and me and my friend uh, that we filmed with we would play the song on repeat cuz it's so beautiful and so it was just a perfect find It's awesome. Uh the journey. I just want to talk. We gave away some of your hats last night as door prizes, a thousand skis. Um it's a new venture and they're handcrafted. Uh can you just talk for maybe a 30 seconds about what is a thousand skis? Definitely. So uh a thousand skis is the brainchild of me and uh three other professional skiers and basically we decided that the ski company that we dreamed to ride for uh didn't exist. and that we wanted to create it and we wanted to do it in a socially responsible way so all of our skis are handcrafted and handcrafted with uh renewable energy so the factory is is powered on renewable energy and if you look at it uh and how you create a ski like the most emissions comes from uh the production so that's huge in in making skis more sustainable and more socially responsible and then also we just wanted skis that we all thought were the best skis cuz we're not going to ride on skis we don't like so we got to do all this amazing testing and then we basically had a consensus like we think this type of ski and how this ski rides is absolutely kick ass that's awesome we got less than a minute so i'm going to ask you two questions if someone didn't get a hat last night as a door prize where do they find it where's your website thank you for the softball a uh, <laughs> thousand skis.com uh it's not spelled a thousand it's like a thousand in numbers and then skis at the end dot com very good and i'm just going to ask everybody out there to go into youtube watch uh love you too cuz i want to get a, a few more thousand views in the next few days uh yes, we're going to we're going to we're going to sign off 20 seconds thank you alex this was awesome thank you so much jeff and thank you for allowing me to share my story it, it's truly a blessing Thank you.